So I'm an evolutionary ecologist and I study, uh, or I'm interested in understanding how species uh, interactions drive and maintain biodiversity. And if I think about living infinitely close or infinitely close, I immediately think about symbiosis. So I will talk today about symbiosis and I will talk about one of the most extreme cases of symbiosis where actually one species is living inside another species. On this picture you see here we have two species. We have a large one, it's a large cell. It's a ciliate called Paramecium bozaria. And ciliates are unicellular organisms you find in every water pattern. So every habitat that has water you will find ciliates. And some of these ciliates live in a really close relationship with green algae. And you see here in this um, picture here, this ciliate is filled up with green algae. So all the small green cells you see here are green algae. And this is very interesting. Um, and if you look around us, you will see that most organisms are actually living in symbiosis, not always in this extreme case, um, like th this extreme case here, but there are many examples. So I'm a scientist, so I usually work with definitions, and I will start by presenting you our definition of symbiosis we use in biology. So we define symbiosis as the intimate and not exclusively positive relationship with prolonged physical contact between at least two different species or organismal groups. And I brought you some examples where we can actually see how important and relevant symbiosis is. And all these examples actually involve or involved endosymbiosis, so where one organism is living inside the other one. So all algae and green plants we have on this planet are derived from a um, symbiotic event that happened more than 500 million years ago. So at one point, a cyanobacteria was able to do photosynthesis, started living inside another cell. And all our plants, all the diversity we see in plants, in trees, um, flowers, and so on, are actually derived from this endosymbiosis event. It's not an endosymbiosis anymore, it's not a symbiosis anymore, because over time, this initial bacterium evolved into a cell organelle, and it cannot live without um, its um, host cell anymore. The second example is something you also all know. You probably have all seen, either in real life or on nice pictures, um, corals. If you look, look at the coral here, this is actually also symbiosis. So it's a symbiosis between an animal, the coral itself, and inside the cells of the coral, there's actually an endosymbiont living. This is another photosynthetic algae living inside this coral. And this is very successful. So symbiosis, symbiotic interactions are often very successful, and we can see this when we look at corals, because corals live in environments that are very um, resource limited. But this endosymbiosis actually allows the corals to live there, and not only live there, but make these very expensive um, calcified skeletons. And this forms actually these big reefs we see, so even though it's an interaction on a cellular level, we can see this from very far away. So we can look out of space and see, for example, the Red Barrier Reef um, at the coast of Australia. The last example I brought you is a picture of a pyramid. This pyramid is made of stones, of limestone, and a large portion of the limestone is actually the skeleton or the shell of now extinct giant Formanifera. So these are also unicellular organisms, they're extinct now, but they became very large, and they also were able to become that large and make this calcis um, shell um, that is now making up the stones of the pyramid because they were living within a symbiosis with a photosynthetic algal cell. So in all three cases, we're looking at something very close, so one cell living inside another cell, but we can see it from very far away, either because it's massive structures we can see, or um, in the case of the plants, this interaction actually transformed our planet and allows us to live as here breathing oxygen. So I will tell you a little bit today about um, how we study symbiosis. So I think this is very convincing that we should look at symbiosis because it's very important. So I'm gonna tell you a bit about how we study symbiosis. Basically asking why do organisms live infinitely close? And I will do this um, telling you about our research, the one we're doing in our lab. So we don't study symbiosis uh, looking at corals or trees, but we are actually something very small. So the ciliate I showed you on the first slide. So it's called Paramecium bambusaria with its algal symbionts, and we work with them because they're extremely small, so they're very small, and we can put them in containers and have in these containers in laboratory many, many individuals. It makes it very convenient to work with, and we can also grow them very easily in the laboratory and under very simple conditions. So we don't have to fly around the globe, collect corals somewhere here and there, or do experiments with corals, so we can just go into our laboratory here in Constance and do experiments. 
We can also easily change the environment, so manipulate the environment and see how this affects the symbiosis, for example. And they're also fun to work with, so these are motile organisms, so they swim around, and if you look into the microscope and you see a sample there, you see them happily swimming around, usually. So, answering the question, why living infinitely close, I want to give you an example how we study this and why um, we think it's important in this case for the paramecium and the algal symbiont here. So this is actually our paramecium, this whole big cell here, the, the brown thing. And then the green circles you see here are actually our algal cells. And these algal cells can live inside the paramecium, so being endosymbiotic, but they can also live as free cells outside. And something simple we do usually is then we just take them apart, so make the paramecium without its symbiont, have the algal cell and measure their fitness, and we don't measure fitness in terms of how strong they are or how um, long they can live, but we're looking at growth rate. So basically measuring how often they can divide in a certain amount of time. And then when we want, want to learn about whether why they live infinitely close, we basically compare fitness when they grow alone or together. And in this case here, we can actually see that a paramecium and the algal cell are doing better when they grow together. So they have a higher fitness or higher growth rate when they grow together. And this is basically the answer we want to have. So they live infinitely close because they're doing better. You want to know more about the system, of course, and why they live better to understand actually how this benefit we see here can also change. So if we look into details, we can actually see that there's an exchange of nutrients and dissolved gases between the algal cell and the paramecium cell. And this is very common. So when we look at symbiosis and symbiotic interactions, we often see that there is an exchange of some products. Usually these products are cheap to produce for one of the two partners, and the other partner needs it, um, and vice versa. So in our case, our algal cells, so the green circle here, does photosynthesis, and one of the byproducts of photosynthesis is oxygen. And the ciliate, the paramecium, needs the oxygen. So it's basically for free for the algal cell, but the paramecium needs it. And also the other way around, the paramecium is producing carbon dioxide, which is just, um, a resource for the algal cells for the photosynthesis. And this is very easy to see why it's beneficial that they live so close together. We figured out that there's another reason why it's beneficial for the algal cell to live inside paramecium. And this is because we, we learned or saw that paramecium is also ingesting many of these algal cells when they're free living. So basically, if you're free, swimming around, meaning paramecium, you're eaten away. But once you're inside, as an endosymbiont, you're not eaten anymore. You're just safe from being digested. And this is not only true for the paramecium we have here. Of course, there's many other predators around and even viruses that might kill you. And once you're inside, you're basically hiding from those. This is beneficial, but this also comes at a cost. Because these algal cells that are free living, they usually are eaten only by, by specific predators. And predators of the paramecium, they usually ignore these free living algal cells. But now they're living inside, and if this paramecium is eaten by its predator, then these algal cells inside are also eaten away. So it's basically always a cost-benefit calculation we have to make to see whether or not it's in your overall beneficial or not. So we know why they live together, because it's beneficial, at least in the conditions I showed you now. One of the questions we have and many other scientists have is actually to understand where does it come from? So why do they live, how did they evolve to live together? Basically asking the question, how do they get from distant to infinitely close? I want to tell you how we think this happens using this cartoon here. So we think that initially there was a, a ciliate, so this the paramecium, this brown um, cell here, feeding on bacteria and completely ignoring algal cells. So there was no interaction. We then do our little test here comparing fitness when they grow alone and together, we actually see there would be no difference in fitness or growth rate. We think that from this scenario, they evolved first a predator-prey interaction. So the ciliate somehow evolved to learn that these algal cells are actually good food, so they started feeding on them. We would then again do our little experiment comparing fitness or growth rate or and on together, and we see that um, the, the ciliate probably has a benefit because algal cells are usually good food, um, but the algal cell actually has a very bad effect here, so it actually has a negative growth rate. And then in the last step, we think that this endosymbiosis endosymbiosis evolved, and again, we would then compare our fitness on that growth rate and see that it matches the picture I showed you before. This involves many evolutionary steps, so I draw three here, but there's probably many steps involved. This is a verbal model. This is how we think it happened, um, but of course, now we want to test whether or not this is true or not. 
and how likely it is that it happens and also what processes are really involved here. To test this, we use a method which um, is called experimental evolution. It's a method we use a lot in our group and in this case, um, we look at the evolution of um, symbiosis or endosymbiosis. So what we do, we take our paramecium um, where there's no we take a paramecium where there's no interaction with the algal cell, put them in a little container, and we take also paramecium in a different container where there's already this symbiotic interaction. Then we expose them to different conditions, let's call them condition A and B, and then we can actually see whether or not in these conditions this interaction evolves to something different, and this one as well. The good thing is we can do this actually in many replicates. So we're not depending on observing it once, but we can actually do it in many replicates and see it many times happen eventually. And this is helpful when we understand actually whether or not this is likely to happen or not to happen, or whether what we observe or not is actually an accident. If we do this, we start our experiment with our paramecium and the algal cells, we wait many generations, and then we can go back to these experiments and actually see whether or not something changed. And of course, if you uh, work with predictions, and one prediction we could imagine is that in condition B, we actually favor the evolution of endosymbiosis. So in condition B, we would, after some generations, see actually that the, the paramecium and the algal cell live in an endosymbiosis, but not in condition A. And we would, for example, expect or predict that in a scenario down here, we would actually lose the endosymbiotic interaction in condition A. And this is really helpful because in such an experiment, we can disentangle causes and consequences. So the cause is actually the condition A or B we create here, and the consequence is this change in the interaction. But we can also look at more details, look for example how the algal cells change, if there's a difference on the surface, and which genes are involved in allowing this endosymbiosis. This is not difficult to do, but what's actually difficult to do is to come up with these conditions A and B. And we can learn about conditions A and B, which so conditions that favor um, the evolution of symbiosis or disfavor the evolution of symbiosis by looking at these organisms and do other experiments, for example, um, and also based on theory. And one condition we identified that is important is actually light. So when we do put our paramecium in standard light conditions in, our ex in, in the laboratory, we see this picture I showed you before. So they're doing better when they're, both of them doing better when they're living together compared to when they live alone. If we increase light intensity, then we actually see change in the interaction. We can see this when we look again at net growth rate or fitness when they grow alone or together. If we increase light to some higher intensities, we actually see that the algal cells do worse when they live together with the ciliate, the paramecium. So the benefits become smaller than the cost of this interaction. If we increase light even more, then we actually see that's also uh, different for the ciliate. So in both cases, living together is you're doing, if you live together, you're doing worse off compared to living alone. And light is, of course, something important for photosynthesis. So it might be surprising, but light also stresses the photosystem of the algal cells. And if it's too much light, the algal cell gets stressed. That's why we see first the shift here towards lower fitness when they are growing together. And if it's the algal cell is, cell is very stressed, then actually we see also this problem for the paramecium here. And this is how we can actually identify conditions under which um, we expect um, symbiosis to evolve. So in this case, we would do it with low light conditions rather than high light conditions. And this is just one example. We have a long list of conditions we are testing. So we have set up an experiment with many more conditions than A and B and this experiment is running, and we don't have an answer yet. But in the end, we will go to our cultures and actually look at the net growth rate when they grow alone or together and see whether or not this has changed in which direction this has, this has changed. This is experimental evolution, and we're working with microbes. And there's, of course, a reason why we work with microbes, because we want to see this evolutionary change in real time. These two organisms have a generation time of about a day, one, once per day. And so they divide once per day. So within a relatively short time, we have rather um, many generations. Nevertheless, for these major changes we're expecting to see here, so going from no interaction to symbiotic interaction, this will take many days and many generations. So that's why I still have a question mark here and I can't give you answers yet. But this is very exciting and we ho I hope that in some time we have some answers um, about the conditions A and B that might lead to the evolution of endosymbiosis and also which processes are involved on the cellular level and also which genes are involved. 
So this was a very brief journey into our work on symbiosis. Um, so just to recap, so symbiosis um, is defined as the intimate and not exclusively positive relationship um, with prolonged physical contact between at least two different species or organismal groups. It's one of the most important species interactions where the outcome of the interaction and for both partners depends on the, con on the context or the conditions. In our case, in my example, it was light and the associated costs and benefits with these conditions. That also means that what we usually see as a symbiosis, for example, our corals, if we change the environment, the symbiosis might also break down because there's no benefit to both partners anymore. And of course, you all have heard about coral bleaching. Um, this is actually when the, the endosymbiont, so the algal cell, leaves the coral. And understanding basic patterns, how they can evolve, might also help us to understand better why or how we can actually protect um, symbiosis on a larger scale. And a symbiosis where one cell is inside the other is involved in many processes on this planet. Um, is involved the production of, uh, involves the production of oxygen and fixing of carbon when we think about plants and algae. Um, but of course, it also um, we can also see it from far away when we look at these structures like these coral reefs um, or the um, pyramids in Gizeh. And I'm at the end. Thank you. Thank you.